Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hope Dector. I'm the creative director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. I'm so happy to welcome everyone to tonight's event, Transformative Justice in the Apocalypse Beyond Survival, One Year Later. Tonight's event features a big lineup of amazing presenters who I can't wait to hear from. So I'm going to keep my intro really brief so we can have as much time with them as possible. I just want to start with a couple notes on accessibility. You can find a link to access live transcription for this event directly under the video on the BCRW event page or in the YouTube video description. Thank you to Becky from Total Caption for providing the live transcription. And thank you to Brandon and Nora for being our ASL interpreters for tonight's event. We're so happy to be working with you again. Kenyon will go over the event format in a minute, but I wanted to let folks know that any questions for the presenters can be asked in the chat on the YouTube live page or by tweeting at BCRW tweets or emailing BCRW at barnard.edu. I want to give a brief thanks to my coworkers at BCRW for making tonight's event possible, including Elizabeth Castelli, Pam Phillips, Tammy Navarro, Avi Cummings, and especially Eve Kausch, who is coordinating so much of the work that goes on into these events behind the scenes including managing the social media and communications during the event. And to BCRW student research assistant, Alex, who is working with Eve behind the scenes tonight. We have several exciting events coming up at BCRW that folks may wanna check out. Next week, we're kicking off the 46th annual Scholar and Feminist Conference on Art and Political Imagination. This year's conference format has been reimagined for this socially distant moment and will feature a series of online discussions, screenings, readings, and performance. Details are available on bcrw.barnard.edu, and we hope that you can join us for the first event this Monday, a film screening with artist Colleen Smith, followed by a conversation with Tina Camp. Another fo event folks here might be interested in joining us for is a book event on May 4th for Victoria Law's new book, Prisons Make Us Safer, and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration. Details are available on bcrw.barnard.edu. We were originally planning to host an event for Beyond Survival around its publication last spring, which we sadly had to cancel as things unraveled. We were lucky enough to hear from the book's editors during two different events that have taken place over the past year. Leah joined us last spring for a conversation with Elliot Fakui on disability justice and transformative justice based on the Building Accountable Communities video series that several of tonight's speakers have been part of. Anna Jarris joined us this fall for a conversation with Miriam Kaba and Dean Spade about mutual aid for survival and solidarity. Links to videos of both of those events are up on the event page. We're thrilled to be here tonight with Leah and Jarris as well as several Beyond Survival contributors and TJ practitioners, including RJ McCanny, Yalini Dream, Woods Irvin, and India Harris. Tonight is both a belated celebration of the publication of this crucial book, and also a chance to reflect on the lessons, themes, and tools from Beyond Survival one year later. So without further delay, I'm thrilled to welcome the moderator for tonight's discussion, the brilliant writer, thinker, and public health expert, Kenyon Farrow. Thank you so much, Hope, and thank you to the Barnard Center uh, for Women for um, this event and uh, for uh, asking me to moderate this conversation with um, several folks who are, uh, I consider, friends and family and whom I have learned a lot from in terms of transformative justice over the years. Uh, and so again, welcome to uh, Beyond Survival, One Year Later, Transformative Justice During the Apocalypse. And I think that we can all pretty much uh, agree that we have been through what feels like an apocalypse over the last uh, year, if not you know, the last certainly four years. Um, and just to call folks' attention, this is the book that we're talking about, uh, Beyond Survival. This is the book that was published a year ago uh, with Ijeris and uh, Leah, uh, as the editors of this um, really incredible uh, anthology. And uh, we'll talk about um, tonight just the specifics of the book and kind of what we've learned in the last year, given the various events in our country from 
uh, COVID-19 to uh, Black Lives Matter and the uprisings of uh, the last summer to even the uh, January 6th attempted coup uh, on the Capitol uh, and the ways in which transformative justice as a frame can help us think about uh, the contemporary, you know, kind of issues of our day in terms of criminalization, mass incarceration, and the use of uh, the carceral state, but also thinking beyond those systems and the ways in which all of the uh, contributors uh, who will be with us tonight and those who aren't with us tonight, but are also included in the anthology um, are building a new world and building a new vision for how we deal with harm and create systems of accountability. Um, so again, the authors uh, tonight uh, of Beyond Survival, Ijeris Dixon, Leah Lakshmi, uh, Pepsna, uh, Summer Rasina, I hope I got that right, Leah, <laughs> alongside New York-based contributors, uh, Woods Irvin, RJ McConney, Yalini Dream, and uh, also uh, our contributor from uh, the Audrey Lord Project, uh, uh, India Harris. Uh, so we'll be talking about um, the book Beyond Survival, Abolition, Transformative Justice. Guests will share specific and concrete tools for holding transformative justice processes, the intersections between violence, accountability, uh, patriarchy, and harm, and how to build community safety in order to address violence, overdoses, and medical emergencies within an abolitionist framework. Uh, and after we have some conversation first with Ijeris and Leah, then we'll bring in our um, co-authors uh, or contributors to the uh, anthology to also discuss their own work in the book and how um, that work um, you know, represents their, their organizing work. Um, and then we'll open it up to some uh, questions that are coming in uh, from folks who are currently watching. So with that, um, I wanna say thank you for attending and I want to uh, invite uh, Leah and Ijeris to join us uh, in this conversation. Hey, hey <laughs> to both of you. I know. <laughs> right? This is this conversation is like family reunion. I'm so happy to be. I was so happy that y'all asked me to do this and to be here um, discussing this with y'all because I really think this is a real. Um, moment where uh, I think we really have to be uh, fully engaged in the conversation of transformative justice and uplifting um, a range of different strategies that folks are already employing and um, hopefully building uh, more towards to really transform the world is what I'm hoping for. I don't know about y'all out there. Um, but uh, I'll start with the first question just um, for uh, Leah Najeris to talk about uh, how do you see, um, what was the genesis of this book? Where did it, where was the idea for it? Um, you know, where did it come from, et cetera? So uh, I'll let either of you take that on. Absolutely. I think we had a couple of pieces of housekeeping we need to say first, but also, hi, we're so, I'm so happy to be here with you both too and with everybody. And it does feel like old home week and just, we wanna welcome everybody to this space. Hi, I'll also, um, it's Ijeris here. So, so grateful to welcome you all to the New York City launch. New York City is a place where um, I, the city taught me as much about TJ as I put into it. And the idea of the event, while we had this tongue in cheek kind of, oh my God, what is TJ in the apocalypse? Mostly because the pandemic canceled our book tour. And uh, while, um, um, me and Leah come to this as co-editors, like it was my first book tour. So I <laughs> was very much like, oh, okay, it's all over now. But the uh, what we were talking about, it was like TJ, in the, like as systems fall, right? As we're noticing so many shifts in the last year, like it was necessary that we put the book out, but then also the way that the conversation around abolition and transformative justice has changed. Like if the, if we're watching all, forms of systemic failures that we already knew were set up against so many of our communities. Who do you want on your team? You want abolitionists and you want TJ practitioners on your team because we are building the world where we're taking care of each other and building into systems. And I wanted to just kick it to Leah to, to offer some ideas on the genesis of the book and whatever else you want to say because you're a genius. We're still doing housekeeping, right? Like I'm supposed to do the land acknowledgement. Yes. I'll yeah, yeah. All right, so that is me, bad facilitator. No, no, no. <laughs> you wanted to get right to it, which I'm right. I was so excited to get to the conversation, but 
Um, yeah, so we'll have, uh, how about we'll just, we'll start with this opening question. So Lee, if you want to respond to that and then we can back into some of the housekeeping issues. Right. That Actually, I think if you could do the um, access stuff first, just so everyone's on the same page. And then I'll just do a quick land acknowledgement and um, trigger warning, like content warning thing. Does that work okay? Sure. Um, yeah, so just to, um, you know, reiterate uh, some of the access um, uh, uh, issues here, I'm just gonna, um, Kind of quickly find my notes. Um, so um, you can find a link to um, you know access the live transcription for this event directly under the video on the Barnard College Research for Women event page, or actually in the YouTube uh, video description. Um, and so we also have um, you know folks from uh, Total Caption. Um, Becky, thank you so much for doing the live transcription. And also uh, we have uh, Brandon and Nora who are our ASL interpreters uh, for tonight's event. So we're really happy to be working with uh, folks uh, you know to provide this level of access uh, to this conversation. So thank you. Cool. Thanks so much. Hi, this is Leah. Um, just going to briefly say that. We're meeting in cyberspace. Um, Barnard itself is located on the traditional ancestral temp territories of the Lenape Nation. Um, every place, every piece of land is indigenous. Every piece of land belongs to somebody, right? And so I just really encourage wherever you're joining us from to, you know, just really think about that for a second and to, you know, acknowledge that we all are on the lands we are coming from different places. Some of us are indigenous to the land we're on, some are indigenous to other lands. Some of us were brought to North America um, through enslavement. Some of us are refugees or immigrants. Some of us are settlers. Some of us are some of all the above. Um, we know that transformative justice is rooted in indigenous struggles that are right now, like land back, treaty rights, um, indigenous feminisms of all kinds. And um, we know that we're not gonna win this thing until we win the complete destruction of the colonial states all over the world, which is a very small and chill you know, uh, struggle in case you were wondering. So I want to start with that acknowledgement. I'm joining you from Duwamish territories in South Seattle. Um, I'm gonna offer a brief trigger content warning that um, this book is about the giant abolitionist feminist project of ending violence, abuse and harm without using the police prisons or the state. As such, people may be talking about and probably are gonna be talking about abuse, violence and harm in some way. Um, we know that we can't, um, that people are triggered by all kinds of things and we just wanna say, we're gonna be talking about it. Um, the great thing about Zoom is there is so much access. So if you need to say, hey, that's it for today, go to the bathroom, go outside, smoke something, whatever you need to do, do what you need to do by yourself and in community. And um, this will be recorded. So if you're like, hey, I need to step, this is a stopping place for me. You can come back and watch it later at your own pace. That's what I've got. Great. Thank you so much for that. And so um, thank you, Ajaris, for, you know, kind of talking about and reminding folks that the part of the reason for this event is that the book tour was canceled a year ago due to, to COVID restrictions. Uh, so Leah, I want to turn to you and actually, um, you know, ask you about kind of the, um, how, why this book now for the two of you, right? So we know that, you know, again, you started working on this book um, probably a couple of years ago before last year's publication, but um, why this book, uh, why now? Mm -hmm. And you wanna start with me? Yes. Okay, why this book? Um, well, so I know that when we started thinking about it two or three years ago, um, you know, we both are friends and movement comrades and people doing different kinds of TJ work for at least 20 years for each of us, I think, in different ways. And we were like, damn, we TJ is so much more in everybody's lips than it was, you know, in the year 2000, in the year 2004. For me, as one of the three people, among them, um, Ching Yi Chen and Jai Delani, who co-edited The Revolution Starts at Home, which was a book of like, okay, here's how you try and do this wild non-state intervention stuff. Um, I was at a point three years ago where people, like the book had gone in and out of print and it was back in print and I was getting these messages saying, we're so grateful there's something. And I was like, there needs to be more than one book. And you know, there's a lot of resources. Miriam Kava's done an incredible job with the Transform Harm website, took like tons of online zines and websites and so forth. But I'm still a real believer in books because I feel like with a lot of movement media that's online, if you're not in the movement, you don't know where to find it. But 
people go to the library and people pass books around. And there's something about that that's really important. And I know that also for me, when people were writing me for resources, I wasn't necessarily sending them right at home. I was like, here's 10, 20 new articles or essays or websites where people had actually done so much more modern to update work. So in my head, I was like, well, we'll just slap this together and, you know, create something. I mean, the original title was the <laughs> Justice Reader, which had no, no, it just had no juice. Mm -hmm. And then the more we started talking about it, you know, we just were like, okay, that's, it's going to be really useful to have something that people can go to and be like, here's how you work with perpetrators. You know, here's some tips. Um, here's ways that you create a community safety, a neighborhood safety plan for your neighborhood against ICE. Here's alternative mental health stuff, all of this stuff. And um, I think, Jairus, you used the phrase, it's a book for a movement in midlife, I think, because we were like, <laughs> wow, it's not 2005 anymore. Like, we've been around for a minute. And I think we both were coming from a place of this is, we want there to be a place where we can talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the questions of where are we at? as people who've been in this struggle for a long time, especially because um, something that we both voiced was like, we felt like there was a lot of the why of how to, uh, of transformative justice and abolition, but it was harder for people to get to the how, right? So there were a lot of people were like, right, abolition, right, no prisons, right? But then there was still a kind of like dot, dot, dot about, but what do you do instead? And it's not that there weren't, we've, we know that there's resources and projects and toolkits, but unless, I mean, there's stuff that I, what I always said was there's stuff that's still kind of in the MySpace generation of tools that if you're just coming into this work now, you're like, wait, sister to sister, what? Like, see our harm reduction zone? What is that? You know, project, you know, just, so we were like, let's create a place where people who've been doing this work for a while can really talk about what we've learned and pass those resources on. And finally, um, I think as part of that movement at Midlife, we really were like, you know, some of what we see out there is people who are newer to the ideas of abolition and TJ, which is great because we're not a tiny, we're not 200 people saying stuff anymore. It's a lot of people who are like, I saw something in the New York Times, I'm interested. But a lot of people sometimes were running to kind of 101 stuff that was like, well, it's just about love and community and we all just come together and it's wonderful. <laughs> and I had people like, what are you talking about? And I was like, this, we were both like, we don't do anyone a service by selling them a bill of goods that's simplifying this shit and being like, all you need is love. Like, I was like, I've had people bring guns to processes I've worked on. It's, and people know that. They're not stupid. They're like, we know this is complicated. So we wanted to have some real talk. I mean, there's stuff in the book that I'm the most proud of where people were like, you know, here's the rage rituals I did when I was in the middle of the TJ process, but I actually still wanted to kill my abuser. So, you know, you can go get a bat and some, you know, bottles and just go to town. And I was like, thank you. Because it's not just like, well, you hold hands in community and it's magic. Right, um, right. My phrase is TJ is not a magic unicorn. So that's some of what we came into the book with. And um, I want to kick it over to Ajaris because I know, I think you were going to take the next part about just like the now part. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, there's so much. Yeah, I I think there's a there's a piece around it. like there's I, for me there's a big difference about individuals um, doing transformative justice and a transformative justice movement, right? And what movements build and what organizing does and what there are so many people who I was encountering who were saying where where do I start. And I was often saying back to them, well, you've probably been doing this in some way, shape or form, uh, particularly as a person who's experiencing multiple forms of oppression, right? And so what I think is really relevant about the book is that people both see like, oh, I have done something like this. Oh, and here's something I've never tried before that I want to implement or, or wow, like I think, Woods will probably talk about work around Oakland Power projects and navigating overdoses, or we can talk a lot about um, like how people are creating like safety structures for parties that India can talk about. Like there are so many pieces where um, one of my one of my uh, dear friends said to me, "I carry the book with me because I know I will use it, and I know that I can point to a part of it and share it with other people." So why now is I think there's um, when I came into the work, and I think I probably I probably like saw you, Kenyon, at one of my first like abolition spaces that I was at. Like I, you know, like like when I came into 
abolition in the late 90s, and then I came into the t into TJ work in the mid 2000s. So at um, at that point, it was just like I would go to these meetings, I'd meet with amazing people, but it, um, but there it wasn't a casual conversation. It wasn't something I was seeing on the news. It wasn't in the New York Times. <laughs> it wasn't right like the, these. Um, so we're in this space where people are are really. Um, both, I think people for a really long time and particularly like black people, queer people, trans people, low income people, immigrants, like we know that the state is violent towards our communities, right? And, um, but people weren't necessarily always sold on, like the question was between reform, right? And like building alternatives or like, let's get rid of this. We have an, an incredible movement building moment where there are so many people talking about what would abolition look like? How do we take care of each other? How do I stay safe? Like, what does this mean? And not from a place of like shooting things down, but from a place of no, really, I want to try this, right? So we've got, we've got more book clubs around this book than we can count, where people are going chapter by chapter. And they're also being exposed to so many other tools, like the Creative Interventions Toolbook or Fumbling um, Towards Repair, or all these different really necessary tools. So I think the reason why why now is because um, state violence against so many of our communities has been really, is, ha, is really evident right now and also the failure to reform the state, right? Like people really are understanding, wait, this is not reformable. We need something different. And our book, I think, shows people a different, like a menu of options for what we're building. Thanks. Yeah, I... Um... You know, just something that you both kind of were mentioning, you both kind of referenced some, um, you know, kind of organizations that, you know, we came into doing, you know, this work. Um, and I'm curious to know from each of you, what was the moment that uh, both abolition and transformative justice kind of either entered your kind of consciousness as an as an actual as those phrases or when you really began to kind of grapple with those questions right about uh you know the use of you know policing prisons the sort of carceral state or punitive measures of whatever sort in terms of dealing with harm and, and violence and creating systems of accountability uh when did that uh start for you uh we'll start with leah mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Um, it's really easy. It's from being an abused kid and being told by my parents, don't ever call CPS. Both as a you know repressive thing and also I was like, yeah, no, I don't wanna get taken to foster care. And I was very clear that like there's violence in this house. My parents are mixed class, working class, mixed race, you know, mentally disabled, you know, all these things. And I was just like, the state's actually not gonna take me out of this. I wish somebody could, but this isn't gonna be it. Um, and then I think in terms of the language of it, um, this is so dorky, but you know, I was this kid who was trying to do all the after school activities to get a scholarship. So I was in Amnesty International when I was 15 and I went to, I got let out the house to go to a youth Amnesty International conference in Boston. And they had a session on US political prisoners. And it's the first place I learned about Malia, about Leonard Pelty, all of these people. And the people who were doing it were abolitionists. And that was um, 1991. Right. So and it blew my mind. And it also made a lot of sense in terms of growing up where I grew up, um, you know, in a really blue collar city with friends who were using IV drugs and, you know, getting caught up and police and just making those connections around like right now, the cops have never been our friends, but there's a name for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, it was coming into going to New York on that scholarship and being around for you know, ending police brutality demonstrations down at City Hall and anti-Giuliani work. TJ, um, you know, I'm, I think I think we might both be this way. For me, I was in a violent relationship within abolitionist and prison justice community in Toronto in the late 90s. My partner was an abolitionist. We were working on the prison justice paper. And by then I had more language around this violence where abolitionists, it's not safe for me to send him to jail. And also it will not help him become less violent. Um, and a lot of other stuff. But, you know, we didn't, I don't remember using the word transformative justice until maybe 2004. We used community accountability or community solutions, but a lot of it was also just wordless. Like we're trying to do something that's not the state. 
Um, but I do remember reading Insights um, 2003 stuff at my work computer because I didn't have dial-up, so I could get things in quicker than five minutes. And I was like, oh my God, there's all these black and brown feminists who are writing you know, 300 different ways of dealing with violence and harm without the police, you know, from all over the world, from like women in India, like raining pots and pans outside of somebody's house who was battering his wife, on and on and on. And I was like, okay, there's, there's a movement out there. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, and for you, EJ, what was that moment or you discovered, you know, uh, kind of abolition, transformative justice, even if maybe before you had the language for it, and then when you came across the actual politics, political movement, the writings, et cetera? Yeah, I was definitely thinking about it in that way, like in the, the place before the words and then the place after the words, right? And so in the, it, before the, I knew what those words were, um, I had experienced and witnessed um, harm and abuse and like interpersonal violence and experienced interpersonal violence, but also seen like uh, people who were abusive and violent towards me targeted by police, right? Mm -hmm. So just like, that's a conundrum to like grow up in and live in um, like as a black queer person, as a black young person, all of those different things, right? And and then, so yeah, but, but it's waves, right? So then, um, I think in 1999, Critical Resistance East Conference was the first time I, I understood what, I learned about abolition, right? And I was just like a 19 year old, like, you know, now I'm aging myself, but like just eating it all up, right? <laughs> and um, then I did other organizing, but was curious about it, came into the Audre Lorde Project at 2005 and was, like we do all this work around police violence, but um, we also need to address um, homophobic and transphobic violence and, and also homophobic and transphobic violence um, overwhelmingly within POC communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that state violence is intertwined with that and that um, getting like, a, yeah, getting a hate crimes charge did not actually make anyone safer, right? Um, and so I think those were, the different pieces and I'm, the way my survivorship has shaped me, but also my life, I'm an inherent skeptic, right? You tell me a theory, I need to touch it. T like I need to like actually understand it. I need to understand it in really plain language so I can explain it to like, like all the family members that didn't go to as many fancy schools as I did or all the people I meet <laughs> who I'm talking to when I'm door knocking, right? Like I need, so for me, um, a th like we can build a world without prisons wasn't gonna hold me. Um, what was gonna hold me was the actual practice of like creating safety plans and safety strategies in community with each other because my biggest worry was, yeah, 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 that sounds really fucking nice, but will you be there for me, right? <laughs> will you be like, who do I call and who will be there for me when I need to run out of my house, right? Because I know what it feels like to not have anyone to be there for you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And I just want to lift up at that time in 2005 when you, uh, you know, started working with uh, Safe Outside of the System at Audrey Lord Project. And I think that's kind of how you and I started working together was around all of those uh, murders, primarily of Black gay men in, in Brooklyn. Uh, Brashawn Brazel was kind of the, the biggest case. And then just, you know, people being attacked and um, SOS really kind of um, getting off the ground, really in bed style, trying to provide that kind of transformative justice thinking. And um, we'll maybe talk a little bit more about some of those strategies later, but, um, you know, but yeah, so the thing about, you know, none of us are as young as we were. <laughs> but we still look good. But we we still are look still good. all holding it together, I will say, <laughs> um, quite well. Um, but in any case, uh, so I, I would like to ask uh, both of you kind of turning to to the current moment. So, you know, the book was released, you know, a year ago at the at just, you know, prior to, uh, you know, the COVID lockdowns. And then we saw, um, you know, a whole range of things culturally happened in the last year, right? From the uh, summer uprisings after uh, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in particular, and a, a bunch of other ones, right? But just those two in particular kind of ignited a lot of um, mobilizations nationally to, um, you know, everything happened as a result of the elections. 
and then the kind of, you know, massive attention to a number of very famous and well-known, uh, you know, from artists and, you know, musicians, filmmakers, et cetera, around their own um, sexual violence and et cetera, right? Like, um, and all the kind of films and stuff that have talked about those folks. So it's been a, a year where looking at transformative justice from so many different kind of cases and, and angles, it was possible. And so I'm curious to know kind of like in the last year, what are your thoughts about the book and how it has spoken to you and to the current, you know, kind of conditions that we've, we faced? It's been, it's been, it's been, it's been this been fascinating, fascinating, sorry, sorry echoing and it's hard, hard for me. Yeah, I'm hearing it. Yeah, Oh, you're hearing a feedback? Okay, um, so maybe our technical folks can uh, try to handle that. Are you not? He I'm not hearing feedback I'm, on my end, so. I'm. Yeah, it's better. Oh, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so the book in this year, it's a fast. There are. There's been this wave of politicization of folks uh, who um, probably had radical politics, but may not have been thinking about abolition and transformative justice in the same ways. And I think it's been, I, I notice a lot of people being like, the system is fucked up, there's nothing out there. Wait, there's this book. So I think there was this way that we were just like, we're doing the thing we've been doing for a good 20 years now, right? We're like, yeah, we're gonna offer some tools and put some tools out into the world. And and then like the book um, got connected to this moment. But I do think that there, people talk about movement moments, right? They talk about these, these points where it becomes really clear to people who maybe have been focused on other things and we're at this place right like the pandemic intersecting with climate crisis intersecting with like like um increases of homelessness people can't pay their rent people can't get the the access to medical care that they need the 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 amount of people that we've lost and if we and we also have to really speak about like what that has looked like particularly in new york right the amount of organizers we lost family members, friends that we have lost. It was a time where um, there was no Band-Aid for this. And there was, and the, the rise of mutual aid is inherently um, uh, connected to TJ, right? Connected to transformative justice, right? It was like, no one's coming to save us, right? Um, and the state is clearly not doing it. So how are we holding each other through these moments? So the book was, um, the book was both right on time and it's uh, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming because I think there's this piece around, um, for me, I think a lot about resisting the celebritizing, resisting the marketization of TJ, resisting, right? Like how do we keep it a movement project? How do we keep it about how we build safety? How do we deepen how we take care of each other and how we, because there is this way that like, Black folks became a marketing point for like non-black folks, right? Like, like I, I care about black people. I got my black people t-shirt. I got, you know, like I'm gonna put on my black people, like um, you know, like I love black people. And that that means that like I'm not one of the bad ones. And um I have a friend that I send these websites to where people like are marketing their abolition and transformative justice t-shirts and are becoming transformative justice and abolition influencers and mm -hmm. So I think the goal, right? Sorry, I'm just shade all. I just had to abolitionist influencers. That just took me out. And it's all right. Abolitionist influencers in five minutes. Right? But all that to say is like, so the goal, as I see it, is like, how do we make this a base building moment? How do we make this a moment to grow the strength of our movements? Right? And not like, the influence of, of some of us who've been doing this for a while, right? How do we resist the fact that like, oh, you know, like the rise of just the, that this is not a point where like, that's how capitalism co-ops us, right? A couple of us can make good money talking about TJ and then things don't change. And so that's, so it's both an incredible opportunity for how many different TJ projects can grow right now and how many people can deepen their skills. And the incredible challenge is how do we ourselves not get seduced by um, the way that people want to elevate the book or us into like influencers, but take out the substance of it, right? And um, 
how how do we focus on putting the skills out there um, to a wider group of people? Those those are that's what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Leo, tell me the question again. Yeah, so the question is, um, how has the book uh, kind of impacted your thinking and the work you know it, it represents uh, given the course of the last year, right? Yeah. What the well, yeah, I'm still just thinking about like transforming justice to a fish. Um, but this this segue, um, <laughs> just this building on what Jerry said. I mean, when I look back at the past year, I'm like, this is like the perfect storm, you know, and. And it's this, it is a movement building moment in that I think that I just want to lift up between the pandemic, white supremacy and fascism and like the ways in which for, I mean, we, you know, we've been in this for a minute, but like for so much of last year, we were like, most people I know were like, do we need to get, you know, do we need to get guns or do we need to get an escape route or like really doing some like serious panicking and also serious building about the threat of a fascist coup about like, there is some really serious, dangerous, frightening, white supremacist organized violence happening. And these people are armed and they've got the White House. Mm -hmm. So what are we gonna do, right? And it just really felt like this is like the gauntlet's been thrown down moment of like, we, it's time for us to practice what we've been preaching and doing all these years. Mm -hmm. But it just got really real. And it got really real in the middle of like tremendous fear tremendous unacknowledged by the powers that be grief of us either losing people to COVID and police murder and prison murder and et cetera, or just living with the fear of like, am I going to lose my whole community? You know, and just that pandemic ping pong of like, your uncle died, your auntie's in the hospital, my sister died, you know, just all of us holding each other. Now the outcome of that is like, as Ajara said, like tremendous, tremendous, like organized and more grassroots mutual aid. And also like so much electoral organizing, not just to get, you know, Trump out of the White House, but also on a local level of like, okay, look, you know, we need anarchist mutual aid and we also need to get our people in to try and move things. And I think it's been interesting to see where TJ and the book, I'm not saying that like anyone's like, oh yeah, beyond survival, it's in the Biden White House. That's all what I'm saying. That would be weird. Maybe it is. <laughs> Right. I just think that, um, what am I trying to say? I think that those are like two really big, really, really big organizing areas that I see people going to, you know, and I see people really being challenged by the panic of the moment and the realness of the moment to be like, okay, if a magic wand came along and we were all president, we were all in control, what would we do? You know, if people with the, the, with, with, you know, TJ being in the New York times and so forth and people being like, okay, on a mass level, millions of people, you want to replace the cops. Okay, I'm listening. Show me how you do it. I think the thing that's been interesting is that transformative justice is a movement often, I've heard people I respect say, we're not about scaling up. We don't want to institutionalize. And I understand that because for so many reasons, we don't want to be co-opted. We don't want to be watered down. We don't want to have to get into bed with the state. Um, we don't want to have something happen where there's some half-assed little 20-hour week TJ position that does nothing, and then it's gone one year in a city administration. Right. But I the, think that- The new diversity, yeah, equity, and inclusion. Okay, so what do we do to deal with all this rape and violence on a mass scale that's not just friend groups? So in terms of like how the book is intersecting, I'm really happy that people have picked it up and are using it, right? And then just to jump on, we are going in. Um, <laughs> and just to jump on what Ajiris is saying about influencers, I think that, you know, capitalism is a beast that keeps evolving. And what I've seen happen is there are people picking up the book and being like, great, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do a reading group. I'm going to start this community safety team, what have you. And then I've seen people who are like, I want this to be a product I can buy. You do it, you know? And I see attention. And that's not necessarily their fault. I understand someone, especially someone who's a survivor being like, I'm tired, somebody come in and do this for me. But there's a tension I find in myself and a lot of other TJ workers where I'm like, look, we're all survivors and nobody, this is not something that we could point and click and buy and have shipped to us on Amazon Prime. We had to create this stuff out of our blood and our bone marrow. And I've heard, you know, every talk that I've been, almost every talk I've been a part of, someone's like, well, no one will do it for me. And I'm like, because you have to create this for yourself. And I understand isolation. I understand low resources, but this is not something that you buy off a shelf at Target. It's something that's organizing. And I think there is that tension with the way late capitalism is right now, where you can buy anything. 
and what people want about something. And I think that that influencer, hitness celebrity, five million hits thing, that, that there's a there's a challenge in that, you know. And I think a lot about people who've been doing this work for years who don't get acknowledged as TJ workers. I'm even remembering a couple. This is pre the book, and then I'll stop. But I'm I'm just thinking about times where I've been at some gathering of people who are quote unquote more visible, seen as more visible leaders in TJ. And I was at one and my friend was like, I'm in Las Cruces with a whole bunch of trans Latinos who are doing TJ work, you know, as undocumented trans women of color. And I was like, man, they're not here, huh? We got to really look at this tension, you know, because of course you want to lift up people who've been doing the work for a while, but there's been a lot of people doing the work for a while. And I'm just thinking about how we all stay connected in the middle of, you know, point and click TJ, late capitalism, right. instant fame, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that's it. And yeah, if we scale up, how do we, I, I will say one last thing, which is, um, no, I'll stop because that's, <laughs> I can bring it to the next thing. Because I, I'm always, my partner's always like, Leah, your, your gravestone is going to say one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> Like, thank you. And we're, yeah, we're going to come back, uh, you know, have more, more time for discussion. So um, I just want to say, um, you know, first, you know, thank you to the um, co-editors of this uh, great anthology Beyond Survival, Strategies and Stories from the Transformative Justice Movement. So uh, we heard from Ajaris Dixon, who is an organizer, consultant, political strategist uh, with 20 years of experience experience organizing on racial justice, LGBTQ issues, transformative justice, et cetera. She's also the co-founding director, or sorry, the founding director of Vision Change Wing Consulting, where she partners with organizations to build their capacity and deepen the impact of their organizing strategies. Uh, and her essay, Building Community Safety, Practical Steps Towards Liberatory Transformation, is featured in the anthology, Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? Police Violence and Resistance in the United States. Thank you, Ijeris. And um, also thank you, uh, Leah Lakshmi uh, uh, Piefsna Samarasina. Uh, Samarasina. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, who is the Lambda Award-winning author of uh, Tongue Breaker, uh, care work, uh, dis uh, sorry, dreaming disability justice, dirty river, a queer femme of color dreaming her way home, body map, love cake, consensual genocide, and the co-editor of Revolution Starts at Home, which was mentioned, uh, confronting intimate violence uh, in activist community. Um, Leah is also a lead artist with Disability Justice Collective, Sins Invalid and is a longtime cultural worker, educator, organizer within disability and transformative justice communities. So I wanna thank you both. And I'm going to um, introduce uh, to our conversation, um, several of the contributors to uh, the book um, who are, and I'll read uh, each of their, their uh, segments of their bio. So RJ McConney, whose work brings together three contemplary uh, passions, transformative justice, somatic coaching, and creative arts. He's a parent, a lead teacher, and board member of Generate, uh, Generative Somatics, and assistant director of intervention for Common Justice in Brooklyn, a groundbreaking uh, restorative justice organization. RJ also served on the lead team of Generation Five and co-founded Challenging Male Supremacy Project. Uh, and uh, also co-led the Foundry Theater um, and a bunch of other things. And uh, RJ and I have also taken many a road trip around the country to various conferences <laughs> over the years. So I uh, want to welcome RJ. Uh, next up, we will uh, also welcome Yalani Dream. Uh, Yalani is a, uh, a with uh, Lankai, Tamil blood, Texas bred, and Brooklyn brewed. Uh, Yali Dream conjures spirit through unique blend of poetry, theater, song, and dance, reshaping uh, reality and seeking peace through justice and lands of earth, uh, psyche, soul, and dream. Yalani Dream has 20 years experience uh, using artistic tools for healing, organizing, and dignity with communities contending with violence and oppression. Yalani is a uh, consultant with Vision Change Win, a wellness a specialist with EM Arts, tours with hip hop storytelling uh, group uh, Brooklyn, uh, so sorry, 
tours with hip hop storytelling group, Brooklyn Dream Wolf, and teaches social justice pedagogy and the arts at the University of San Francisco's graduate program in human rights and in, in, uh, international multicultural education. Uh, next up is Woods Irvin, uh, who is a black non-binary trans person from the South who is deeply immersed in movements for racial and gender justice for over a decade. Woods began organizing in 2006 in Chicago with the Broadway Youth Center, both as a case manager to develop trans and to develop transformative justice practices for street-based trans youth. Woods has been a member of Critical Resistance since 2010. From 2014 to 2018, was a part of rebuilding uh, transgender, gender variant, intersex justice or project or TGIJP as we know it. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least is India Harris. Uh, and India is um, with the Audre Lorde Project as the director of programs. Uh, the Audre Lorde Project is a lesbian, gay, bisexual, two-spirit, trans, and gender non-conforming people of color center for community organizing focused on the New York City area. Through mobilization, education, and capacity building, AOP works for community wellness and progressive social and economic justice. Uh, committed to struggling across differences, they seek to uh, uh, responsibly reflect, represent, and serve in communities. Uh, and uh, as program director, uh, India is responsible for programming and organizational administration, coalition building, campaign organizing, and member leadership development. India began her experience with AOP as a member of the Safe Outside the System Collective and uh, Safe Outside the System Collective, uh, which Jairus and I also mentioned, is uh, focused on community-based responses to violence against LGBT, uh, STG, and C, people of color rooted in transformative justice. So I want to thank you all for your uh, contributions to, uh, to the book Beyond Survival and uh, frankly to your work uh, in the world and all of whom uh, I also have had a long, you know, working in community and love friendship with Yalami Woods, uh, met through doing uh, work with Andrea Ritchie and <laughs> folks through some conferences and um, India, who I know less, but have been able to kind of observe, do her thing at various uh, community meetings and conferences. You probably didn't know I was looking, but uh, <laughs> have been uh, admired your leadership for the last few years. So thank you all for joining. And uh, we'll start with RJ and um, just, you know, talk to us about um, your uh, piece in the book or the piece that you were a part of, of writing. And, and I think specifically, um, you know, also about your own work around, you know, kind of challenging, uh, you know, patriarchal or what we call toxic masculinity and also in um, child, childhood sexual abuse and thinking about transformative justice through that lens. So RJ. All right. Thanks, Kenyon. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be by this fire with this group. Um, and I'm really appreciating the, the shady Gen X, uh, X annual energy that some of us are bringing to the table. I'm curious, what does that have to do with TJ? Um, yeah, so the, I was um, a part of the group from Generation 5 who, uh, we have a piece from a handbook that we created that's excerpted in, in Beyond Survival. And I really appreciated I think the thing that, that Leah said earlier, um, which is, you know, we, we created this um, ending child sexual abuse, uh, a transformative justice handbook, right? We created this document. Um, we printed off some copies of it. Um, you know, it lives on a website. You can access it for free. But there's something about these kinds of texts also, you know, getting to live inside of books. Um, and, you know, I, I, I came to TJ through the, you know, starting out as, you know, being active in the Brooklyn chapter of Critical Resistance, which I think is where you and I, Kenyon, overlapped. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, hearing about Generation 5 and hearing about people talking about child sexual abuse from, you know, a transformative justice framework, which didn't mean anything to me at the time. Um, and I actually sort of hid from it for a number of years until it sort of smacked me in the face. And, and I was like, okay, I need to, um, you know, I was ready. Like I was kind of ready to look at my own lived experiences as a um, child sexual abuse survivor 
um, and think about what does that have to do with the abolitionist politics and work that I've been involved in. Um, and so that's sort of how I came to it. I think my, my first workshop with Generation 5 that I attended was like in 2005. Um, and then we kind of built from there. And uh, the piece that, that appears in Beyond Survival, um, again, it's an excerpt of this handbook um, that we created, you know, child sexual abuse. I don't think it's controversial to say that this isn't very easy to talk about. Uh, I've been talking about it for a long time and I still find it difficult to talk about. I still feel anxious um, often, especially, you know, in kind of like public forums to talk about it. Um, so we created this handbook, which really builds on an earlier document. The handbook came out in 2017, but there's an earlier Generation 5 document from 2007 uh, that was really created to sort of convince the, the activist and movement left that transformative justice is something that, uh, you know, we should be interested in. And so by the time we got to 2017, we, you know, we, we, we realized we we're in a different moment, right? A different moment was just starting to sort of, something was turning. And we thought, okay, you know, let's, let's create a handbook now. Let's create something that, you know, that I would feel comfortable handing to a family member, a, you know, a, a neighbor, uh, someone who's not necessarily particularly politically active as far as I can tell, um, you know, but that I could hand this to them. It would kind of look nice. It'd be attractive. They want to open it and read it. And, and it would feel um, like relevant. And so, you know, I think all the work that, that you and Lee and Ajaris have spoken to really led to a moment where we could put out something like that. That wasn't about convincing people of transformative justice, but it was really about like creating an opportunity and an opening to use it as a tool. Um, and that can also be for someone who's, you know, a survivor, a bystander, or for someone who's a perpetrator. You know, and I, and I think that's part of this transformative justice framework is really understanding that we really need to be uh, directly addressing all parties involved and really thinking about creatively, um, how do we make this relevant? Uh, that's the big yeah. thing I wanted to plug on here, Kenyon. You know, yeah. that's the tool I, I wanted to plug. I have a quick, a quick follow up for you yeah. um, is, you know, it's obviously no surprise to you that, um, you know, childhood sexual abuse and trauma is probably one of the, you know, kind of places through which when those of us who are, you know, talking to folks about transformative justice and abolition is, is often the kind of first place that people go when they want to refute yeah. uh, that as a, a politics and a, and a possible political vision, right? Yeah. It's, you know, the what do we do with the child molesters and rapists, right? That's often the, the way it's, it's framed. And so um, if you could speak to the your writing and then your organizing work about how, um, you know, you have seen possibilities in addressing that particular question for folks um, play out. No, I, I love that question, Kenyon, and you're right. Yeah, it's like, what do we do with the murders and especially the, the child rapists and how much child sexual abuse gets leveraged to push a right-wing agenda. I mean, we're, that's QAnon, right? That's QAnon, like, writ small is like, like the first thing is like, we're getting the, you know, we're getting the, the, the child sexual abusers. It's incredible. Um, because of course, it's, it's terrifying. It's horrific. For many of us, that's our first response. But part of the work is getting past that, right? And like, what's the actual effective way to address this? And what's fascinating, and I'll kind of speak to like the hardest piece you know, what's fascinating is when you really when you really dig into it, you know, what you find out is that people who uh, commit child sexual abuse, right, like it, it is a wide diversity of people, right? So there's some work that's literally like sex ed work. Most people who, who do this as, as, as young people, right, who maybe sexually abuse someone who's more than two years younger than them, who's much smaller than them, right? Most of those folks don't grow up to be sort of like lifelong uh, aggressors, pedophiles, right? So that right there tells you something about, you know, what, what should we be doing with that group of people? Then there's a bunch of people in the world who have, um, you know, sexual ideation, right? About being with a young person, a baby. And, and for many folks who, who have that, it's deeply troubling. Right. It's not something that someone is like, yeah, this is what I want to think about. This is 
This is what I want to go out and do. They're literally wrestling with uh, those feelings. And if we don't create spaces to actually invite folks in and catch folks, right, then, then we're actually doing every survivor of child sexual abuse a disservice. Um, and there's a really groundbreaking program uh, in Germany um, that, that actually has done public advertisements um, and has done you know, a bunch of work to actually invite folks who experience that kind of ideation to be able to come into a space where they're going to be able to talk about that and work on that and ally with each other um, so that they never actually act on those behaviors um, in real life. Right. And, and there, we know a lot of folks that struggle with this kind of ideation also do this in online communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's something we should be scaling up. And then thirdly, there's groups of folks who have already acted on these ideas. Right. And, and who have been caught in the system. And uh, there's something called circles of support and accountability um, that are used uh, in some states in the United States uh, throughout uh, the land that's called Canada to the north of us and in other parts of the world. And that's a system where the way that the way that a person who 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 actually commits this kind of abuse goes through the prison system comes out, um, the way that that person is best sort of prevented from acting on those those desires again um, is actually through building a group of people around that person who who's often isolated. Mm-hmm. You do something like that, you go to prison for it. You're extremely isolated typically, and the best thing we can do is actually build a circle of people around them. Um, that are going to hang with them, work with them, right? When they come out, um, it's not to further isolate them. So there's just a few things I'll say, but those are actually evidence-based, you know, effective responses for addressing child sexual abuse. Um, storming the Capitol with, you know, conspiracy theories about, um, you know, the Democrats and and. A pizza shop and things like that. Yeah, you're not saving any children. You're not preventing any child sexual abuse. Thank you so much, RJ. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we'll uh, move on next to uh, Yalini Dream. Man. Thank you. Um, so Yalini, um, thank you for um, first being my friend, <laughs> uh, being a part of this conversation and, um, you know, kind of uh, turning, you know, the, the sort of tables a little bit um, and shifting the conversation. Um, I would love to hear you talk about, you know, first your, um, you know, kind of offerings in the book and, and also just as someone who does a lot of cultural organizing um, about the role of of culture and and organizing in terms of uh, creating, uh, g- g- you know, a sort of vision for folks of what transformative justice can look like, and inviting people into um, to imagine that in a through using arts and culture as a as a strategy. Uh, you're still muted. If you could unmute yourself, there you go. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, Uh, Thank you so much. It is wonderful to be in the space with um, all of y'all. And I actually looked up uh, Critical Resistance East um, and it was, this is the anniversary, the 20th year anniversary of it. Um, So it happened March 9th through 11th. um, and, And many of us who were who are here were there and it was a very powerful and transformative um conference and and um, how I came into closer community with a lot of um, abolitionists and folks who um, when we started naming transformative justice as a practice um, came into it um, so I I think so back to your question and then also just really sitting with with um, just the pow- so many of the powerful offerings that RJ uh, Gave like I feel like um, yeah I was I was really moved by um, by by thinking about how we truly um, address uh, child sexual abuse and um, what really you know stood out for me is the ways in which uh, authoritarians are so good at manipulating valid pain and anger into hate and also manipulating it into these political agendas that are upholding these violent systems. And 
thinking about the ways in which transformative justice is a paradigm shift. Um, it, you know, how, how are we actually going to do things differently? And how do we cultivate uh, spaces, uh, organizations, formations, communities, societies where violence doesn't happen with ease, where we're actually able to uh, uh, hold people accountable, do the kind of um, structural interventions um, that um, RJ also spoke to, like from an educational perspective to, um, you know, how our different systems and processes run. Um, and then also, um, you know, what, are, what, what, what do we need culturally also to shift in order to be able to do that as well. Um, and I think about that a lot also like with Vision Change when, um, you know, uh, a lot of, some of the work that I do is supporting uh, organizations and, and spaces in some of these uh, cultural shifts. Like so, and one huge thing is really thinking about our relationship to conflict um, and, and, and the idea of generative conflict, because I think the dominant cultural norms and an economy that is uh, centered around war and extraction and domination also teaches us about um, conflict as something that is about domination um, and uh, versus uh, the, the idea that our different ideas, that divergence is something that um, opens up space for visionary ideas um, that can uh, give us an opportunity to have um, different uh, solutions that can meet many people's desires and underlying concerns um, and maybe underlying wounds as well. What is the pain that's underneath that, right? Um, that has that need that has not been addressed. Um, and so those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. And I think uh, through our, uh, I, I really feel like, um, you know, uh, I believe in creative play as a spiritual practice, um, as something that uh, can be an opportunity to connect deeper with ourselves, that can be an opportunity for us to heal, and then can also give us the tools for us to be able to imagine beyond the, um, the binaries that the dominant culture uh, sets up for us in order to serve supremacy, right? These are your choices, this or that, right? And with creative play and artistic and cultural work, we have an opportunity to really imagine, you know, in 1986, Bernice Johnson Regan talked about how, um, you know, cultural workers, specifically African-American um, women cultural workers were, uh, you know, supporting black communities in, uh, for a future beyond uh, slavery. Um, and so if we are thinking of, you know, um, drawing upon that in the title of the book, if we're going beyond survival, um, what is our role as a cultural worker? And how as cultural workers are we also um, supporting, um, subverting the polarization that benefits these uh, supremacist and authoritarian um, agendas? Thank you. And um, one other question for you is um, so much of your you know, work also deals with, uh, I mean, part of it you just named in terms of um, kind of war and conflict in that way, right? And, um, and also, um, you know, in terms of borders, right? And I think, you know, this is kind of another uh, kind of edge within thinking about transformative justice work is, uh, you know, kind of the uh, erasure of certain kind of borders where it, it creates a sort of us in them and uh, we deserve and they don't, right, in these kinds of ways. And that can be, you know, about, you know, kind of folks of color within, you know, a, a kind of white supremacist society. It can also be within tensions within ethnic groups within the same, you know, kind of nation state, if you will, right? And so I would like for you to speak to a little bit more about your, you know, kind of work and thinking around these kinds of questions about, uh, you know, uh, borders and militarism as they pertain to a kind of vision to a, a more transformative justice uh, vision. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, 
so uh again i think you know to we to go beyond uh the current reality of these dominant nation, these nation states where humanity is organized within um, often ethno-nationalist nation states uh, with these militarized borders is also a paradigm shift, right? So um, how are we, um, you know, able to have pluralistic visions? Um, you know, wh where, uh, you know, as someone who is from a minoritized, minoritized, minoritized <laughs> community, so, um, you know, that's an ethnic minority, a religious minority in our homelands, and then also queer, uh, you know, we would never have the numbers uh, to be able to um, have that kind of political um voice in a majoritarian state right so i'm i'm always curious about um you know pluralism and the, and the space that allows for uh the minoritized or outcast community to be able to um um advance society to be able to help society be able to evolve um so so that's the large, you know, philosophical guiding question, right? Mm -hmm. um, and but I think, like, you know, the large, the larger vision is how do we shift human economies away from extraction, domination, war, and violence to uh, economies that are centered around interdependence, um, nourishment, wellness, and in right relationship to the earth. Um, and uh, and that does mean that we have to. Um, completely shift the paradigm of these nation states that have these violent militarized uh, borders that prevent the mobility of um, people within their own ancestral lands, right? Um, and um, I think, like, you know, for, for myself, I, I understand um, the conditions of peace um, as a uh, uh, Norma Wong actually spoke to this today, that within the conditions of peace, um, it doesn't mean that we don't have conflict. It doesn't mean that we don't have violence. It's just that that violence can't proliferate with ease, that we have systems that are holding, um, you know, that are preventing, interrupting, and addressing that. Um, and so it it is both, yes, on an inter on a personal level, I, I want to cultivate the practices of generative conflict, of um, solutionary thinking, of um, you know, subverting polarization, of being able to connect with people, active listening, um, empathy, being able to draw boundaries um, and um, interrupt harm, prevent it, self defend myself. And then we also need to think about it on a structural level as well. How do we actually reorganize these human systems in order to be able to um, cultivate generative conflict, to be able to support uh, the, um, the outcast um, from society, um, to be able to shine in their full wisdom and be able to contribute to our collective evolution. Cool, thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, we'll uh, move on to uh, Woods Irvin now. Um, and as soon as we bring uh, Woods into the conversation, um, ah, there you are. Um, so Woods, um, I want to again ask you a question um, to yeah speak to your um, contributions, um, you know, in the book Beyond Survival, and also you know what you sort of see, um, you know, kind of happening in the space of your work, particularly you know, working um, and develop and having the kind of tools and experience of building real transformative justice systems within uh, trans and gender non-conforming, um, you know, communities in the in the U.S. Okay, um, so um, the contribution in the book um, is um, about the Oakland Power Projects um, that Critical Resistance uh, pull together. Um, and we pulled that together, um, as we closed out our work, uh, waging a grassroots fight against gang, gang injunctions in 2010 to 2013. 
Um, and so the goal of the Oakland Power Projects was to build the capacity of everyday Oaklanders to invest in practices, relationships, and resources that um, build community power and well-being um, and uh, build robust community safety without policing. Um, so really rooted in PIC abolition or in prison industrial complex abolition and the um, uh, and the politic of, of TJ. Um, and so the idea was that through a series of conversations um, with everyday people, we would get a sense of what their experience was with policing, um, what problems police are purported to solve um, in their experience or um, in their thinking more broadly, and then do some good thinking together um, about what concrete solutions um, practices, infrastructure, uh, et cetera, that actually would solve those problems. Um, so then we then determine what capacity um, we all together could organize uh, to build those solutions. Um, so as you may have seen in the chapter, um, one of the projects we talked about was our health worker cohort um, where we brought together a variety of health workers to create what we called um, know your, uh, the Know Your Options curriculum. And it had four workshops um, and a series of tools. And the workshops were on intervening in behavioral health crisis, chronic health crisis, um, acute emergencies, so like falls or gunshots and stab wounds, and then opiate overdose. So, um, and the work was to open up the space or the curriculum was to open up space uh, between the moment where a health emergency occurs and the moment where 911 is called or police arrive. Um, we wanted to open that space and give people a variety of options for how to address the situation. So we coordinated with health workers to create a curriculum and help workshops for community organiza organizations and buildings and neighborhood centers across Oakland. Um, so um, in the sort of immediate, some of the things that came of it, um, there were all the stories, um, people really like appreciated the workshops, but then there were all the stories that would circle back to me about people sharing um, how they'd been present during instances in which a criminalized person was having a health crisis in public, and sometimes not having a crisis, but being perceived as such. Um, and then they found a variety of creative ways to interrupt that person coming into contact with police um, based off of, um, a, uh, and it's not just, I'm sorry, not just, uh, um, yeah, having a health crisis. Okay, so, and then, um, and it, it, They'd, they'd found a variety of creative ways for folks to, um, to, to try and interrupt that person coming in contact with police. Um, and then sort of like one notch up from there, um, there was the organizing um, that was done by those health workers outside of those contexts, now armed with more abol abolitionist language and thinking um, to shift their workplaces. Um, so we then would support health workers with organizing at the community health center to build protocols to handle a majority of the center's crises without calling the cops, which is significant. Um, there was also some support for a health worker who was trying to organize um, the um, like Oakland Police Department officer desk out of Highland Hospital. Um, and so from those connections in that work, CR was then also able to support the American Public Health Association, launching their policy statement, arguing that policing is a public health issue. Um, and that was worked on for three years from 2015 to 2018, and finally voted on in November 2018. So um, the policy statement also like, arg like argues recommendations for decriminalization and how that promotes public health. So like one last, thing or like story I want to tell is I like when it, is that um like around um CR's or, or organizing um with the Stop Urban Shield Coalition um where we were able to bring back some of those health workers and then build 
out a cohort of, of um, health and emergency workers as part of the campaign. Um, but because Urban Shield, a SWAT training and weapons expo was siphoning off federal funds under the guise of being an emergency preparedness training, we were able to use that fact um, as a wedge argument for funds to go to actual emergency preparedness training um, and go to the health and emergency preparedness workers who had been defunded. Um, and that would actually prepare the, like the Bay Area for what it actually, what emergencies they actually have, which are fire and public health disasters. Um, so I'll, st I'll stop there around like the piece in the book. And can you um, remind me of the second question again? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to stop just to, for in the sake of time so I can get Indy in here before we take a break. But I want you to, um, you actually answered part of my question and your your response about um, you know building um, you know real power and transformative justice practices within trans and gender nonconforming communities. Um, so you you actually responded to it. Um, when we come back, I just maybe want you to think about how to um, how do we think about the sort of current moment where there is such large um, you know kind of attention in this country to to trans issues and where there's you know, a lot of arguments around, you know, kind of hate crimes legislation or things of that nature as protection, um, which may be, you know, may be unfamiliar with some of our audience to think sort of like differently about what are ways of creating real safety, right, in, in, in those contexts. Um, but we'll have to come back to that after uh, we take the break. But thank you so much, Wiz, for your, your thoughts here. Um, and hello, India. <laughs> Uh, I want to uh, bring you into this conversation and, you know, yeah, ask you to talk about, you know, your and, and, uh, and Audrey Lorp's projects, um, you know, kind of offering in the book, um, you know, about um, the uh, Safe Outside the System program to talk about, um, you know, that writing and then the work that y'all are doing in terms of, you know, uh, just like Woods in terms of building real grassroots strategies to build real community safety and what that looks like. Yeah, so the chapter that was shared in the book um, was about the Safer Party Toolkit. This was something that lived in uh, within the generations or the lineage of the Safe Outside the System Collective, really beginning work on it in 2007, and then various folks added to it, looking at strategies and ways in which community um, can intervene and make sure that we are able to enjoy parties, make sure that we're able to have a, um, a fun and enjoyable time knowing how much our very existence is criminalized um, as queer people, as trans people, as people of color, knowing that our communities are often um, gentrified and therefore over-policed or even um, preyed upon by, you know, private security agent agencies and things like that. So really putting this toolkit together to see um, how community could respond, party promoters, um, party planners, the bouncers, like having a very different orientation, especially around um, the de-escalation uh, part of uh, violent acts or interpersonal conflict and actually putting these measures forward in order to pre prevent um, violence. So the Audre Lorde Project has community-led security at most of our um, public events and also partner with the Justice Committee and other um, organizations to provide security at actions, marches, parties, um, and even um, wakes and funerals, the experience that I want to reflect a bit about, upon as um, something that I did as, as, as a part of the ALP um, security team, and that was um, serving a security for a wake, at a wake um, for a young um, Black disabled man that was killed by the NYPD in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. The family reached out um, and wanted to make sure that we would be able to, to help interface um, to keep the media and keep the police you know, out of the wake, the wake was happening um, in a church. And as a part of that experience, we were able to deescalate a fight that broke out outside amongst community members. Like 
people are in a heightened sense of grief. They're in a heightened sense of just um, just frustration and upset. Um, they lost one of their community members, and again, experiencing the sort of gratuitous violence um, that comes as you know, state-based violence from the police. Um, and you know, we didn't want anyone to get arrested, and so we employed those de-escalation tactics. Just talking to people, I'm like, you know, you look like my cousin. I understand you want to have this drink. I'm gonna need you to not bring this drink in the church. I'm gonna need you, you know, to actually be able to physically get involved and to say, you know, can I talk to you over here? Do things to help distract a bit and to um, physically de-escalate to make sure um, that people had that they had space, right? While being able to also acknowledge the pain, acknowledge the upset of losing a community member and affirming the ways in which they wanted to express their grief. Obviously not through um, conflict, but by just living life that especially in New York City is often criminalized, you know, where we got a quality of life um, crimes, right? People being outside, people perhaps drinking outside, um, gathering, any of, any of our everyday activity um, being criminalized. And so as much as we were there to also take care of the family's needs. We were there in support of the wider community um, that was there to you know, be together and honor the loss of their friend. Um, and something that I also wanted to offer um, that I saw as um, something that's comparable between, you know, people think of a party and a wake, you know, they were like two different things. Um, but what I wanna uplift about them is that they're both parties, wakes, you know, school. These are all community spaces. They provide sanctuary for our communities. Um, they have a moral responsibility to guarantee everyone's safety. And they also have power. They have power to leverage and decide whether or not they want to engage with the police. They have power um, to keep the police out of their spaces. I mean, that is one of the... Um, tactics that we go over is to say, no, we don't have to let the police into a party. The police definitely are not, you know, don't have to come into a wake. They don't have a warrant, right? And so a lot of that, it's really important that as well as we have de-escalation and um, intervention, that we also know know our rights, know, know how we can elect those rights. Um, and there, so that gives these institutions, these community centers, the opportunity to address our community needs, getting people food, clothing, counseling, rest, learning, housing, right? That is in essence what they are there for, right? They're not there for surveillance. They're not there, you know, um, to sort of be gatekeepers, right? And how do we as community members, especially as the Audrey Lord Project work with and help train and resource and skill Folks, so that they are able to, um, that, so that they are able to keep our community safe. Thank you for that. Um, and I, um, I, we're gonna have to take a, a break now, so I can't ask you a follow up. But I, I'll come back to you after the break um, because I, I want to hear more about um, uh, parties and joy and pleasure in transformative justice, right? Which I don't think we talk enough about and. Audrey Lord projects. I want to hear more about your strategies, not just in terms of like providing security in those kinds of venues, but also the ways in which you infuse the actual organizing work with that, uh, you know, with a, a certain kind of like, you know, joy and 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 pleasure and things. So, um, thank you so much, India. Um, so, uh, to our audience that is uh, currently watching, we're going to take a ten minute break. Uh, so we'll be back in ten minutes. Um, I just want to remind folks that uh, if you have questions, we will come to them right after um, for the last uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. We'll take a five minute break. Uh, <laughs> it'll be a five minute break. We'll come back or, like at 830. Um, and uh, remember that you can put questions if you have them for the panelists into the YouTube chat or you can tweet them to uh, B C R. W tweets, one word that's at BCRW tweets, or put them in YouTube chat and we'll get back to your questions as soon as we come back in five minutes. 
Uh, thank you so much. So we'll be, see you uh, very shortly.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so we're gonna um, move into uh, more of a kind of uh, questions from uh, folks who are who've submitted questions uh, who are watching now, um, and then uh, a little bit of time for folks to also point audience members to some resources, um, both in terms of organizations or campaigns that are happening now or other kinds of readings to help support people's learning about transformative justice that folks may be interested in. So um, looking at some of the questions that have come in. Um, so uh, there's a first question about how do we combat uh, burnout and pessimism in organizing? You know, we want to appreciate the small wins, but feeling like nothing is moving forward. Um, and I'm actually going to bring India back for that question, because that's part of the question I was asking you at the end before we broke about, uh, you know, thinking about joy and pleasure and doing this kind of organizing, which is often about really hard and sometimes, you know, violence and trauma. Right. So um, how do you uh, at Audrey Lore Project think about, um, you know, uh, preventing sort of burnout and pessimism from you know, doing what is sometimes really you know, difficult work? Yes, thank you. Um, there's some there's feedback. Some... Can you hear that? I don't hear it on my end. So. Okay, I don't hear it anymore. It's fine. Um, definitely the focus on, you know, celebration and cultural work. We have a lot of folks who share, you know, their gifts and talents as far as musicians and poets and visual and performing artists are so really celebrating that as a community, having cookouts, um, you know, barbecues, um, and getting to know one another, like still obviously very much um, enjoying life and actually working with folks around doing wellness planning. Like what do you need to help support you in your life, right? Not only um, to organize, but what, what would be, um, you know, supportive and healing to your well-being. Um, it's so funny because you asked that question and I'm just like, this is violence, this is very serious. And you're like, party, pleasure, right? It's like, you know, to do these things and to do this kind of work in service um, of people having a good time and having boundaries and knowing when to call it. Like, I know that when I was working um, that it wasn't perhaps the best idea. Like I did not need to drink, right? I need to have clarity of mind. And I came there for a specific role. And I also needed to understand as Ejeris and many others um, taught me was that the point is for us to keep our community safe and for them to not get arrested. And so even though I'm somebody who definitely is like, if you want it, you can get it, right? That's not the attitude I have to have when doing security, <laughs> right? And trying to bring more right. of a peaceable attitude. Um, and just like another thing that I remember Ijera is saying, like, we're not here to recreate the carceral state. So we're not the bouncer. Like we see community, we speak to them, we smile, we engage them in conversation, right? We are not there to look, you know, mean and rough, right? That's not the point of this. The point of doing it is to keep people safe, but also to build community. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, and then there's a, a question uh, for Leah um, that came in. So the question is, there's a difference between uh, devolving skills and um, this sort of one size fits all, you know, for kind of scalable transformative justice uh, processes. Um, how have you seen different communities around the world uh, both, you know, kind of skill up and share knowledge uh, and maybe, um, you know, kind of expand the work, but also thinking about the sort of tension about scale, you know, the sort of pressure to come to scale, right? I think is question is asking about the balance between those two things. Uh, you're on mute, so if you could unmute yourself. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this works really well because I realized that I was going on about electoral versus mutual aid, and then I was like, I missed the fucking point. So I'll get to that in a second. But um, I just want to say that I first of all want to honor the ways that for a lot of us doing TJ work, we've been very protective at times of like, it's just me and the three people who maybe get it, who are trying to do this work. And there's been a lot of ways that avoiding scaling up has made sense. However, I think sometimes it's led to people just being like, anything more than me and my best friend is the state. And I think some of the examples I've seen of people 
experimenting with scaling up are kind of in this curious middle ground of evolving strategies. So some examples could be everything from um, just three off the top, doing things like study circles, learning to action circles, study groups. There's a lot of different groups I've seen in Toronto, Australia, places across North America, where people who are new to TJ Ben like, let's get together and read a bunch of stuff and talk about it and then practice, mm-hmm. right? Things like that. Things like um, Safety Team and Safety Lab and Safety Fest, which were things that CUAV, um, C-U-A-V, Communities United Against Violence, did in the early 2010s that were these big festivals where they were like, we're going to bring people in and have club nights, writing workshops, practice groups, like queer and trans, black and brown self-defense trainings to help bring in lots of people to learn about TJ in a fun way and then take it back to their communities. Um, I'm thinking about also API Chaya, which is a Seattle-based Asian anti-violence org. They started doing a program a couple years ago that really offered mentorship that reached out to long long-standing TJ workers and we're like we want you we know you've been doing this work for 25 years for free take a step back if you want mentor these young ones we're gonna like pair you up to go have coffee right and they really were like so many people get thrown into TJ and then are like oh god I fucked it up but they had no one to talk to they had one zine so instead let's have a win-win thing where people can support each other and finally just going back to the electoral stuff um I know I've historically had suspicions like a lot of people about whether it makes sense to throw in a lot of our work to electoral politics, but I'm, we've been seeing like what I meant to get to when I was talking about um, people doing different abolitionist, often abolitionist black feminist campaigns for elected office in the United States over the last year, especially is you see people actually being like, you know, me being elected to city council isn't destroying the state, but it could advance some goals. And I just threw into the chat, um, Nikita Oliver, still my mayor, um, who ran as a black queer feminist abolitionist mayoral candidate in Seattle four years ago, is now has just announced their campaign to run for the city council seat in my neighborhood in South Seattle. And it's like, we could end Seattle's contract with the King County Jail. We could stop, you know, seizing people's assets and like, you know, asset forfeiture to fund stuff. We could um, actually take the militarization out of 911 and bring it back to peers and community workers. Um, Those are really interesting goals, right? And that's a really interesting proposition to throw out there. Um, I think about the initiatives, last thing that people have done, um, that kind of move towards a reparations framework that take it out of, take your abuse to court, And more things like in Toronto, we had a victim's compensation fund for a long time where you did not have to take your abuser to court or have a police record. You could just go and you still have to make a statement about this is the rape, this is the abuse. But they would just give you money from city and provincial taxes. That's like, here you go. Mm -hmm. Spend it on therapy, spend it on whatever. And that was really useful for a lot of people where they were like, my uncle's never going to admit it. But I got this 10 grand from community that acknowledge some harm happened, use this to try and fix it. Those are just five examples. Um, I think the possibilities are endless. And Ajaris is saying in chat, we had a fund at ALP. And yeah, I think, you know, CR actually just had a mutual aid fund um, that launched a little while ago. Hi, Ajaris. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. So, let, let, so then I'll send you, send you here, Ajaris. Hello. <laughs> let's, Hello. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's get to this, this piece about mutual aid and maybe if you could pick up and talk more about also for folks who are listening and who will come to this later who this is kind of a new concept or thinking about uh or or, you know want to learn more about what mutual aid is and what are you know some practical strategies for that um that are about transformative justice that you have seen or organized around well i I think I really have to lift up, like Dean Spade's been doing a lot of incredible work with his new book on mutual aid, with a lot of education on mutual aid. And um, I think Dean actually asked me, or we were in conversation at some point, like, is TJ mutual, is transformative justice mutual aid? And I think inherently, like the idea of mutual aid is communities taking care and building projects to take care of their own basic needs. Not as like, sometimes we get into these debates around like mutual aid versus, but the idea is that like we have movement ecosystems, right? Direct Mm -hmm. action is an ecosystem. Our campaign building work is an ecosystem. And also we like people need survival based projects and programs to be able to stay in the work. Otherwise, if people don't have immediate survival needs, we might be organizing the wrong people. Right. Um, And so the idea, like we have a long tradition of 
mutual aid projects um, within Black communities, within Black radical communities. People think of um, a lot of the survival programs within the Black Panther Party as part of the legacy of mutual aid. The idea is that the state is not designed, um, the state by design and capitalism also by design are not going to take care of the needs of our, our folks. And so many people experience that particularly in the pandemic, right? So where people were ordering, were bringing each other food, bringing groceries, um, helping people get access to med medical care. There's even um, mutual aid projects in New York City right now that are helping people sign up for vaccines because the vaccine process is so incredibly difficult and horrific to navigate um, for so many. So I think there's, there's a piece around our communities. Uh, we build power as we build support and mutual aid is a, is a vehicle for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a question uh, of, of RJ. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a little bit put you on the spot. <laughs> this is not a question <laughs> that we talked about, but I, I'm thinking about it now in this context. <laughs> you can, you'd be mad at me later. But, <laughs> but listen, we're both from Ohio. I'm from Cleveland. I, have, I now live back in Cleveland. Uh, and uh, you are originally from Cincinnati. And, um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about the, um, you know, kind of growth of, you know, white nationalists, um, you know, neo-fascist groups um, that, you know, many of which were kind of responsible for, uh, you know, the January 6th attempted coup on the federal government, uh, et cetera. And I, you know, so I, I ask you this question, um, you know, as you know, we're both from, you know, a part of the country where there's been so many of those groups that have uh, kind of emerged out of, or this is Ohio is, is now one of the major kind of operating grounds for many of those groups. And so I would love to hear your thinking about, um, you know, transformative justice, which for a lot of us, and particularly for a lot of black and brown folks that want to be like, you know, Efton people, um, you know, and a transformative justice, go after the FBI with all your might or whatever, um, to just offer like you're thinking about, um, you know, kind of what's happening in um, the space of, you know, white middle America. I can do this, Kenyon. I, I, can, I can do this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And what we should be doing uh, in, in a, a way to think about transformative justice, but that also obviously holds accountability. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm of the camp that we should always think of transformative justice expansively. You know, that sort of rather than thinking of it as a sort of a set of taboos, you know, don't call the police or don't use these systems. Rather than foregrounding the the sort of like things we should not do. I always want to encourage folks to think about it more as a framework for helping us figure out, you know, liberatory responses to, to these kinds of problems, right? Whether it's sort of state violence, paramilitary violence, um, you know, that's endemic to, to, to this country or intimate partner violence. So I'll say that first. Another thing I'll say is that, you know, a, a quote that really stuck with me from early on in my sort of transformative justice training is um, a quote from Beth Ritchie that creative interventions would use this at the beginning of their presentations, uh, storytelling organizing project would put it up. Beth Ritchie said, our goal is not ending violence. It is liberation, right? So, you know, and, and this was coming, coming out of the anti-violence movement, right? And, and having to sort of clarify that work around gender violence was, a, was, was about liberation rather than you know, we want to see violence or not see violence. So I say that, I say all of that to say that, um, you know, I'm not particularly interested in getting caught up in into situations where we're expected to um, sort of argue against this tactic or that tactic. You know, my problem, my primary problem with what happened at the Capitol is not that people storm the Capitol. The, the primary problem with it, and I think this should be our orientation, is that what we were against were, was an undemocratic white supremacist force trying to continue to impose its rule on the country, right? 
that's, that's our primary concern. Not whether they should have used this tactic or that tactic. That's what we're trying to defeat, you know? And so like when I think about transformative justice, the last thing that I'm worried about are white supremacists being suppressed by the state or the, this particular cop being, you know, held accountable through state mechanisms. Like I stay far away from those conversations because, because I think it's a trap and it moves us into this conversation of tactics when we should really be talking about the politics and what's happening and social forces. And we're literally talking about social forces that want to maintain the Confederacy, right? And social forces that want to break through and build a multiracial socialist democracy, right? That's where I wanna live in. And, and I think that transformative justice offers a lot of frameworks that can help us make smart decisions about addressing these forms of violence. But I think we gotta stay out of these traps around tactics and, you know, arguing about this cop shouldn't face, look, they're not facing charges anyway. They're barely facing any sort of consequences. I'm not too worried about it. Right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for taking that at the last second, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, one more question before I, I ask our panelists to uh, kind of talk about, um, you know, some, you know, kind of next steps and point people towards some resources. Um, so this question will be for Woods. Um, what advice do you have for people who are supporting survivors through transformative justice and or community accountability processes? What advice do I have for people? Um, well, I would advise people to, one, know that there are, there's resources out there for people to, to look at, to learn, to grow their skills. Um, there are, as has been noted multiple times on this call, there are practitioners out there who are and willing to support people with thinking through how to support, to, to hold processes, how to shape containers, how to um, sort of surround containers with, and when I say containers, I mean like any number of people in a facilitated space in order to move, um, or survivor through um, a process or figure out how to transform a system of a, a, a incident or series of, of, of harms. Um, and also that, Like I think what's been talked about on this call a, like a, a lot is that um, part of what the systems of the prison industrial complex and the military industrial complex do is try and hurl a one size fits all model of reproducing violence um, and leaning into abolition and transformative justice ask us to actually do this really, really challenging work of really getting to the root causes of harms as folks have been saying before. And so, but I think that there's so much opportunity in that. I think there's a, um, uh, a quote by Mary Hooks, the former director of song, where she says, be willing to be transformed in the service of this work. Um, and that is hard, but that's like, be generous with yourself, but it's hard work to do. Um, and that work of transforming yourself as we do this is also, um, it's difficult, but you're not alone in it. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. And um, I'm going to follow up. Well, first, I just want to say kind of one comment to that, that I, I love that quote by Mary because I it's what I love Mary. And then too, um, 
you know, I think it actually also speaks to, um, I think something that we haven't really talked about tonight, but I think we need to, you know, grapple with as a movement, which is um, as we sort of move away from, or in the sort of debates around um, kind of defund the police and abolition, you know, and thinking about transformative justice, to also articulate not just moving away from kind of, you know, the state apparatus of discipline and punish, whether police, courts, prisons, et cetera. But, you know, sometimes the things that I sort of see online, right, in some respects also border on like mob, uh, you know, responses, right? And so I think, you know, like, it's, so I, it's also the piece around like understanding the, the, you know, as people will talk about the cop in your head, right? Or the way in which, you know, we, where the places in which you as an individual have a rough time with um, thinking about transformative justice and kind of want to genuflect to, you know, call for revenge, right? And because I see like, even the people, some people who I see who like would say that they're abolitionists, but also really are working through a very, a kind of revenge and punitive frame, even if it's not the cops per se, right? But it's another mechanism. Anyway, I just wanted to say that piece. <laughs> it's something that I'm thinking about how do we also deal with. But um, I I would just ask you to uh, close with, and then I'll go down the each, each panelist um, for a real quick moment uh to speak oh i see oh oh, everybody people want to jump in on that question all right so this is what we'll do uh so we'll bring up um leah to respond to that question and also just give us how folks can get involved um you know uh in transformative justice work organizations recommendations for readings for books things that people should be paying attention to we'll start with leah uh you're on mute Do you want to say what the question was? Because I think yeah. it was in the chat, but and then we were chatting in our chat. But. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, um, how do we deal with, um, you know, as a movement, um, you know, folks who are newly thinking about abolition and calling themselves abolition, but also, um, you know, what I see is expressing some things or acting out in ways that are also kind of about maybe not state violence, but kind of mob violence, right? Or kind of moving towards, you know, things that are very, uh, you know, uh, questionable in terms of not just like we're against the cops, but also like want to think about like accountability that doesn't like devolve in like, I have a right to then act out violently in certain situations with people. Do you know what I mean? Like Totally. Oh, sorry. I got confused. In our chat, I, there was a, a separate question, I think, where I think a lot of people, there's some questions on the YouTube chat where a lot of people are like, what about serial killers? And I was like, I could speak to that. Okay. Could... Speak to that. <laughs> that that's okay. fine. Go there. Go okay. there. Um, so I, this is actually something that someone emailed me about recently. I want to say real quick, a um, couple of things. One, um, there's actually, and this is not just a big advertisement for, for Beyond Survival, but there's actually a couple different people who talk about their community-based experiences, um, you know, as Black and Indigenous queer people dealing with serial killers without the cops. Um, so if you go to Audrey Huntley's piece in the book, she works with a group called No More Silence, which is, you know, north of the fake border, Canadian Indigenous network of feminists who have been dealing with missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people without the police for years. And Audrey talks in detail about her work actually working with No More Silence, finding out who's kill, who, who some serial killers are when the cops were just like, we literally don't care. And she talks a lot about, she's like, you know, forensic skills are honestly just asking people questions. You know, if I go to some boarding house, which is the last place someone was seen before she disappeared, um, okay, are the poor people there, are they gonna talk to the cops or are they gonna talk to me? I'm this mixed race indigenous queerdo who's like, hey, I'll give you a six of beer if you tell me the last time you saw that girl. And she's like, they're actually more willing to talk to me. And she talked a lot about different things people in her community done had done from using medicine to just actually using like community-based social media and indigenous networks to find people, right? So that's one example, um, Monica, um, Monica, Sorry, I'm blaming Monica Forrester, who's a long-term Black and Native um, trans woman, two-spirit organizer in Toronto. She talked a lot about the disappearance of Alora Wells, um, who disappeared 
they people went to the cops they were like we don't know we don't care and there was a community based search party that was organized that found her body she also talks about the case of Bruce MacArthur who's a white gay man who was a serial killer targeting mostly um, actually South Asian and Arab, including several Sri Lankan gay men who would come to Toronto's queer village and who, you know, this went on for years. It was an open secret. There was a white man hunting mostly brown immigrant men in the village. The cops didn't care. And it was community who found out what the hell happened. So she talks about that experience. So there's some, this is just a taste because we're at two minutes, but I want to say that like, we have more skills than we know and there's a lot of people, in particular sex workers and criminalized folks, who have been used to people disappearing for years and who've learned to organize when the police literally don't do anything. Yeah. And we have our information gathering and fact-finding skills we can draw on. Yeah, thank you. So um, if I could ask our production folks to bring everybody up on camera, because I want to give uh, first a kind of a last minute uh, opportunity for folks to um, quickly shout out um, uh, resources or how people can get involved if you have, um, you know, specific uh, names of organizations or websites or places where people can go to uh, plug into some organizing work or at least some learnings. And uh, we'll start with India. So for more information about the Safe Neighborhood Campaign and their upcoming events, just visit alp.org. Um, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Audrey Lord Project. We'll be having a membership orientation on March 30th, and we will have a community safety and safe space training in May. Thank you, RJ. So sorry. Um, so obviously I wanna say check out um, Generation 5's Ending Child Sexual Abuse, A Transformative Justice Handbook. You can find it for free on the website. Um, also wanna say check out um, challengingmalesupremacy.org, uh, which is um, a website sort of memorializing the work we did in that project. And really, I just wanna encourage folks, you know, just practice collaborative. If they were on this, they would say this, try some shit, try some shit, document it uh, so that someone else can, can sort of take that and do the next iteration. Thank you, Yalani. Um, I'm gonna uh, shout out, I know um, Ijeris and I, I'm also a consultant with uh, Vision Change Win, which is the consulting team that Ijeris has, um, um, is the founding director of. I'm gonna shout out the community safety program um, and just the, the different tools um, to really think about how do we keep our communities safe and secure in the face of a great violence uh, without relying on police enforcement. Thank you, Woods. Yes, um, so uh, Critical Resistance is going to be running an Abolition of Policing 2.0 workshop in the next month, so check us out um, on our on our website at criticalresistance.org um, or our Twitter or Instagram, we'll post there once the, the, the date gets finalized. And then on March the 30th or 31st, we're still nailing down that date as well. We'll have a webinar on um, organizing around policing and imprisonment um, in the context of uh, COVID and this new uh, political re configuration um, sort of one year later. So look out for that. Thank you. Uh, Leah? Should I say anything? Because I'm not in New York. I'll just throw up two things. I'll throw out two things. I'll throw out um, Nikita for nine. If, even if you're not in Seattle, looking at the demands that them and their campaign are making as they run the abolitionist platform for city councilors is really fascinating. I also want to shout out Cat 911, which is based in LA, um, but is a network of groups called Community Alternatives 911 that I think are a really incredible possibility model for people who are like, let me form a local neighborhood group that can actually start building ourselves as a place that people can go to instead of 911. Thank you. And uh, did India, did you? Do we go already? Yeah, I started with India. Okay, sorry. And uh, last but not least, Ijeris. And before uh, Ijeris goes, I just want to say, um, you know, behalf of myself, thank you all for 
uh, attending um, this event. Um, if you don't have Beyond Survival, you should get it. And um, there's one question about civil confinement that I saw in the chat too. And I just would point people to uh, an organization, the Center for HIV Law and Policy, which is currently doing some work around civil confinement, uh, particularly on the case of Nushan Williams uh, in New York State, uh, which is an important case, I think, to think about how civil uh, commitment is used uh, to keep people essentially imprisoned. Uh, and it's, it's certainly an issue for uh, folks concerned about disability justice, where, uh, you know, folks are uh, civilly committed to, uh, you know, quote unquote, mental health institutions against their will. So um, with that, I want to point folks to that. And again, thank you all for your time and uh, commitment to be with us tonight. Thank you, Ijeris. Thank you all so, so much for being here. Thank you, Kenyon, for moderating us, and Leah, and RJ, and India, and Yalani, and Woods. Um, so one event, uh, Vision Change When we have a community safety toolkit, we're doing an event with Project NIA on the 25th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. That's called Building Your Abolitionist Tool Toolbox, where we will go through the toolkit with you and talk to you about how you can adapt it. And it's about like, how do you build abolitionist um, safety and security practices? But beyond that, this book is not designed to be a secret between you and yourself, right? This book is designed to accompany you in your practice. So if you have the book, that's awesome. Step one. Step two, call your friend. Step three, call three other people. Step four, go through it together right, and see how it can apply to your life, to your organizing work, and to the communities that you're within. We built this so that you don't need to rely on us. You didn't have to come to the Zoom. You didn't have to come to the Barnard event, but we're happy you're, you're fucking here. But more than anything, we want more people in this movement. We want more people building these projects. We want more people building safety. And so oh, the, the next questions are really for y'all. Thank you for coming. <laughs>